When you have black... I'm just completely changing the subject just for a minute. When one has black and white thinking... So black and white thinking is hugely important in any phobia because the moment you say to yourself, I can't tolerate that... Is that a good picture? Thank you, love. The moment you say to yourself, I can't tolerate that, you make your life so much harder. Okay? Because the moment you say you can't tolerate that, whatever that is, you have to avoid it at that point. Okay? The moment you say, I cannot tolerate that, you have to avoid it. If you think about, um, I can't tel tolerate the idea of being raped, I can't tolerate the idea of being in a car crash, I couldn't tolerate the idea of being in a haunted house for the weekend, I couldn't tolerate the idea of um, swimming across a, a, a freezing river. But the moment you say, I can't tolerate that, you then have to put into action avoidance. So if you reduced that, I can't tolerate that, to I really don't like that, but everything changes. So once you get out of that black and white thinking and just make it a shade of grey, everything changes. Because if you think you might be able to tolerate it a little bit, this huge 100% of safety-seeking and avoidance behaviours suddenly becomes about 10%. The greatest change that you'll see in yourselves going through the program is when you get out of your black and white thinking about not being able to tolerate. And when it becomes even the slightest bit grey, like Mary said, you know, perhaps I could tolerate, everything changes. Because most of your anxiety stems from the fact that you think you can't tolerate under any circumstances, I could not be sick, it'd be the worst thing in the world. To... Actually, do you know, I could, and it'd be awful. That's only a minor change, but has a profound change in the way you respond to the thinking. Okay? Because you have to be black and white thinkers in the first place to have any sort of phobia, really. Reduce that to, it would be awful, but I could do it. And it changes overnight. So get out of your mind the idea of thinking, I couldn't tolerate that, I couldn't do that, it would be the, the worst thing in the world. Do you know it wouldn't be the worst thing? You actually know it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Okay? It might be unpleasant for 10 minutes, at worst. It might be a horrible feeling for 10 minutes, at worst. But that's all it would be. So stop saying, I couldn't tolerate, I couldn't do that, it would be impossible, it would be terrifying, to it would be awful but. Okay? Be awful but. And so many of your safety-seeking and avoidance behaviours would change overnight. Just from redu reduce that 10%, and your safety-seeking and avoidance behaviours will reduce by 90% from that small action you've taken. Okay, so remember that black and white thinking has a profound effect. The moment you say, I can't, you have to take loads of action to avoid. And if you think about it in terms of primary and secondary control, yeah? Good, few nods. Okay. So primary control, remember, this is in, within locus control. Primary control is about the beliefs you have, about the skills and resources you have, effectively to avoid or stop something from happening. Primary control, the actual event from happening. Secondary control is effectively the belief you have about the skills and resources you have to be able to put up with that thing or tolerate it if it did happen. So all phobias, then, are created by people who have strong primary control and very poor secondary control. If I don't think, under any circumstances, I could be on an airplane flight that was bumpy, if I don't think I could tolerate that, the only thing I can do is not fly. If I think I'd be absolutely terrified and wouldn't deal with it well if I had a spider walk across my floor, the only thing I can do is make sure there's no spiders in the house at all. I'll seal out the windows or do whatever I can never live in the country, blah, blah, blah. If I think there's no way on earth I could tolerate being sick, I have to do everything I can to never be sick. And that's why you end up feeling completely neurotic, because you can never do enough to be certain you're not going to be sick. Okay. You can never do enough. If it really is a fate worse than death, you can never do enough to know that it's not going to happen. Because no matter what, how many safety-seeking and avoidance behaviours you did today, you cannot guarantee you're not going to be sick today. And you're trying to guarantee that. You're trying to guarantee in your life something that's impossible to guarantee. 
okay? If you only use wipes on your hands, if you only eat lettuce, if you only cook your own food, if you only drink Lourdes bloody water, okay? It doesn't matter how much you do, you might have got a bug from somewhere. You might be sick. That's why your phobia is so big, because you're trying to make something, that you're trying to control something that is actually unpredictable. All right, you probably won't be. Some of you may not ever be sick again for the rest of your lives, okay? But you can't say with any authority that you're not going to be. That's why you fill yourself with anxiety. So if you reduce that a tiny bit to um, being sick's awful, but if it actually happened, I could put up with it, you'd cure yourself in a week. Yeah. So as you build your secondary resources, and your secondary resources are almost entirely emotional. So what I'm saying is, if you get control over your emotions and stop thinking that they're happening to you all the time, and you get even a modicum of control over them, your secondary control becomes a little bit better. At that moment, it's very easy to change from, I've got to avoid this at all costs, I can't be sick, to it's horrible, but I probably wouldn't die if I had it. And that's a complete game changer. Then, then you've reduced that to a normal phobia, which you can get over in a week. Yeah? So I'll answer Elizabeth's really good question from this morning a little bit later on. Moving on. <laughs> so, uh, to answer Elizabeth's question, hands up. It's a genuine question. I do apologise about this, Layla, and it's an honest question. Okay, hands up. Who likes farting? Be honest, ladies. Be honest, okay? Right. So, just ladies, keep your hands up if you like farting. Ladies, Tony. Sorry. Ladies, okay? Okay? Okay. Good. See me afterwards. It's got nothing to do with it today. So, one of the things that you want to do to help really anchor in your mind that actually emetophobia isn't something that's happening to you is to realize, actually, that the split between the sexes is actually about 90 to 95% female sufferers. I say sufferers, in inverted commas, obviously, because you're doing it to yourself, can't feel sorry for you, okay? To 5 to 10% men, okay? In just about all other phobias, the split is more or less 50-50, okay? So fear of cancer, fear of flying, fear of dying, fear of injections, uh, fear of dogs. It's pretty much 50-50, the split. Sometimes as high as 60-40, Okay, because actually a, a mad dog barking at you and growling at you can be a little bit frightening. Okay, equally frightening, excuse me, to men and women. Emetophobia is 90 to 95 percent women. Are there any males in the room that have got emetophobia apart from Stephen? Two. Okay, so two out of 30 people. That's probably about right. Okay, two out of 30 people. Okay, the reason why only a very, very small percentage of sufferers. Um, uh, male, is because one of the key components for it is actually a symptom that, generally speaking, women tend to have far more than men, which is disgust propensity. Okay? Disgust propensity. So how much you dislike bodily fluids, farting, spitting, being sick, uh, pooing, being sweaty, snot. No matter how much sport, you can watch Saturday sport, okay, on Saturday, strangely, okay? And you'll often see men doing that horrible thing, not even I would do, go, oh, excuse me. <laughs> well, take that out, Duncan. <laughs> okay? I would never do that, okay? Ooh, that's actually quite a relief to do it. Have you tried that? <laughs> you never see women doing that, even hockey players. You won't see them go up, score, go, uh, how you doing, love? All right, yeah. You never see that. Women don't do that, okay? Part of the reason for that is in just about every culture around the world, women from a very young age are brought up to be sugar and spice and all things nice, okay? They're brought up to be nice, pleasant young ladies. They're not actively encouraged to go and climb trees and not actively encouraged to go ro roll around in dog shit. They're not expected to get dirty and pick their noses and swear and eat bogeys and all that kind of stuff. And girls aren't, uh, sorry, girls aren't, and boys are. And that's what happens in every culture. Even in the cultures where they try to account for it, 
It's like the famous experiment where they don't give the boy the little doll, they give the girl the action man and the boy the little doll. The boy gets the little Barbie, but he still goes around shooting Indians with it. And the girl gets the, the soldier and takes the camouflage clothing out, makes him a little bed and nurses him and starts feeding him. Okay? So partly it's cultural, partly it's genetics and genes. But right from an early age, us blokes, for example, go to toilet in front of other blokes. Right from the age of about two or three, we wee in front of other people. Okay? Mary might have got to the age of 220 and never once actually weed in front of somebody, have you? Okay. So no is the answer, okay? So that's never been normalised. The act of weeing, doing something personal, sorry about this layer, okay, which is sometimes a bit smelly and all that kind of stuff, never done it. In all her years, she's never done it. Boys do it all the time. And then they chat about it. And then they joke about it and they laugh about it. And if, if you're a man and you're having a poo in a public lavatory next to another bloke having a poo and it makes a plopping noise, both men will giggle. <laughs> you've, never met, you've never met the person in the cubicle next to you, but you can hear him sort of <laughs> under his breath and you have a little giggle, especially if... I'm really sorry about this. Especially if it's a real loud fart as well, OK? <laughs> Any bloke would be laughing his head off at that, right? And it's fun. And I'm really sorry to say this on film, but actually the smellier the better. OK? Now, look around the room. The women are generally speaking are going, oh, the bloke's going, yeah, fair play. Yeah? That is disgust propensity, OK? And even though you might not have high disgust propensity now as an adult, because some of you are 